Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite history books. It was called The Conquest of New Spain, and it was written by Bernal Diaz del Castillo, also just basically known as Bernal Diaz. The reason this book came to mind was because of a recent article that was brought to my attention. It was published in July, July 1st, 2017. The title was Tower of Human Skulls Found in Mexico City Dig Cast Light on Aztec Sacrifices. Archaeologists find more than 650 skulls near the site of Templo Mayor. It was in the center of present-day Mexico City. But back uh, at the time of the Mexican conquest or the conquest of the Aztec Empire, it was known uh, by a different name. I think it was Tenochtitlan, some old uh, Mexican name. But just to read a little bit of the um, <clears throat> of the article, a tower of human skulls unearthed beneath the heart of Mexico City has raised new questions about the culture of sacrifice in the Aztec Empire after crania of women and children surfaced among the hundreds of Im hundreds embedded in the forbidding structure. Archaeologists have found more than 650 skulls caked in lime and thousands of fragments in the cylindrical edifice near the site of the Templo Mayor, one of the main temples in the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, which later became Mexico City. The tower is believed to form part of the Hue Zompantli, a massive array of skulls that struck fear into Spanish conquistadors when they captured the city under Hernan Cortes. The structure was mentioned in, a contemporary, in contemporary accounts. Historians relate how the severed heads of captured warrior, warriors adorned Zompantli, or skull racks, found in a number of Mesoamerican cultures before the Spanish conquest. But the archaeological dig in the bowels of old Mexico City that began in 2015 suggests that picture was not complete. We were expect, expecting just men, obviously young men, as warriors would be, and the thing about the women and children is you'd think they wouldn't be going to war, said Rodrigo Bolanos, a biological anthropologist investigating the find. Something is happening that we have no record of, and this is really new, a first in the Huey Tzompantli. Raul Barrera, one of the archaeologists working at the site alongside the huge metropolitan cathedral built over the Templo Mayor, said the schools would have been set in the tower after they had stood on public display in the Tzompantli. Roughly six meters in diameter, the tower stood on the corner of the chapel of Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec god of the sun, war, and human sacrifice. Its base has yet to be unearthed. There was no doubt that the tower was one of the school edifices mentioned by Andreas de Tapia, a Spanish soldier who accompanied Cortes in the 1521 conquest of Mexico, Barrero said. In his account of the campaign, de Tapia said he counted tens of thousands of skulls in what became known as the Hue Zompantli. Barrero said 676 skulls had been found, and the number would rise as excavations went on. The Aztecs and other Mesoamerican peoples performed ritualistic human sacrifices as offerings to the sun. So that's the entirety of that article. But that article brought to mind a book that I'd read 20 years ago, and I'd actually had a recent conversation with a friend about the book. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Bernal Diaz, a little bit about Hernan or Hernando Cortez, and then do some reading from the true history of the conquest of New Spain. So uh, Bernal Diaz was born in Spain like all of the other conquistadors, but the interesting thing about him is that he had been in two other, uh, two other adventures in the New World, in the Caribbean area. He had been to uh, Panama, what they called in Panama was, uh, it was a different name. They referred to Panama as, um, what was that, Terra Firma. Um, and that, that's now known as Nombre de Dios in modern Panama. But he was there in 1514. But after two years, everybody got sick, so he left. And that was the first uh, adventure he had had in that area. And then the second one is he went to Cuba and, you know, basically had a difficult time um, in that area. But one of the, the interesting aspects is that in March 1517, he came to the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, a very critical event happened on the Yucatan Peninsula while he was there is that he met some other Spaniards and who had, had been in a different shipwreck. And that one of those Spaniards would become a translator because that Spaniard learned to speak Mayan. And uh, during Hernan Cortez's uh, conquest of Mexico, this Spaniard would be, you know, would be a critical uh, linguistic asset for the, the conquistadors. Um, but uh, he had then returned back to Cuba, and that's where he became part of this campaign with Hernan Cortez. 
Hernan Cortez was one of the early colonists and uh, from Spain and went to Cuba, where he uh, came under the, the aegis of the local governor, a guy by the name of Governor Velasquez, who, who saw something in Cortez and gave him some, some land and some other things. But it was an interesting thing about Cortez is that he had been in Cuba for about 10 or 15 years before he even set foot in Mexico. And he had seen and uh, watched and heard stories of other failed, uh, you know, failed missions that expeditions that had been taking place and had been gone to that that area. But it was in 1518 that Cortez was in command of an expedition, and he basically, you know, uh, he was accompanied by 11 ships, 500 men, 13 horses, and cannon. And he initially landed in Mayan territory. And it was there, like I was talking about, that he came across a man by the name of Geron Geronimo de Aguilar, a priest who had survived a shipwreck but had been in captivity. And it was there through this Franciscan priest that he was able to uh, learn the language of the Maya that was locally, locally there. So he then left this kind of Mayan, this Yucatan area, and went to Tabasco. <clears throat> and there... Um, Let's see, he, he met a woman while he was in Tabasco, another woman by the name of La Malinche, who became Cortez's mistress. But the interesting thing about Malinche is that she knew the language of the Aztecs, Nahuatl, and she also knew Mayan. So Geronimo de Aguilar could speak Spanish with Hernan Cortez, talk Mayan to Malinche, who could then speak Aztec to the Aztecs eventually when uh, when 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 Hernan Cortez became in contact with them. So, um, and it was in 1519 that uh, Cortez eventually met the head of the, the Aztec Empire, a guy by the name of Moctezuma, or Montezuma, as they say here in the States, but it's Moctezuma is the appropriate pronunciation. So this is a reading from The Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz. This is chapter 31 from Bernal Diaz, how we arrived at the Rio de Grijalva, which in the language of the Indians is called Tabasco, of the attack the Indians made on us, and what else happened to us with them. On the 12th of March, 1519, we arrived with all the fleet at the Rio de Grijalva, which is also called Tabasco, and as we already knew from our experience with Gravalja, the, that vessels of large size could not enter into the river. The larger vessels were anchored out at sea, and from the smaller vessels and boats, all the soldiers were landed at the Cape of the Palms which was about a half a league distant from the town of Tabasco. The river, the river banks, and the mangrove thickets were swarming with Indians, at which those of us who had not been here in Gravalja's time were much astonished. In addition to, uh, to this, there were assembled in the town more than 12,000 warriors, all prepared to make war on us. For at this time, the town was of considerable importance, and other large towns were subject to it, and they had made all preparation for war, and were well supplied with the arms for which they are accustomed to use. The reason for this was that the people of Poton Chan and Lazaro and the other towns in that neighborhood had looked upon the people of Tabasco as cowards and had told them so to their faces because they had given Grijalva the gold jewels which I've spoken about in an earlier chapter and they said that they were too faint-hearted to attack us although they had more towns and more warriors than the people of Poton Chan and Lazaro. This they said to annoy them and added that they in their towns had attacked us and killed 56 of us. So on account of those taunts which had been uttered, the people of Tabasco had determined to take up arms. When Cortez saw them drawn up, ready for war, he told Aguilar the interpreter, who spoke the language of Tabasco well, to ask the Indians who had passed near us in a large canoe and who looked like chiefs what they were so much disturbed about, and to tell them that we had not come to do them any harm, but were willing to give them some of the things we had brought with us, and to treat them like brothers. And we prayed them not to begin a war that they would, as they would regret it. And much else was said to them about keeping the peace. However, the more Aguilar talked to them, the more violent they became. And they said they would kill us all if we entered their town. And that it was fortified all around with fences and barricades of large trunks of trees. Aguilar spoke to them again and asked them to keep the peace. And to allow us to take water and barter our goods with them for food. And permit us to tell the Calachones. It must be like the the caciques, the kind of bosses, things which would be the, to their advantage and to the service of God our Lord. But they still per persisted in saying that if we advanced beyond the palm trees, they would kill us. 
When Cortez saw the state of affairs, he ordered the boats and small vessels to be got ready and ordered three cannon to be placed in each boat and divided the crossbowmen and musketeers among the boats. We remembered that when we were here with Grisalva, we had found a narrow path which ran across some streams from the palm grove to the town, and Cortez ordered three soldiers to find out in the night if that path ran right up to the houses and not to delay in bringing the news, and these men found out that it did lead there. After making a thorough examination of our surroundings, the rest of the day was spent arranging how and in what order we were to go in the board boats. The next morning we had our, our arms in readiness. After hearing the mass, Cortez ordered the captain Alonso de Avila with a, and a hundred soldiers among, the, among whom were ten crossbowmen to go by the little path which led to the town and as soon as he had heard the guns fired to attack the town on one side while he attacked it on the other. Cortez himself and all the other captains and soldiers went in the boats and light draft vessels up the river. When the Indian warriors who were on the banks and among the mangroves saw that we were really on the move, they came after us with a great many canoes intent to prevent our going ashore at the landing place. And the whole river bank appeared to be covered with Indian warriors carrying out, carrying all the different arms which they used and blowing trumpets and shells and sounding drums. When Cortez saw how matters stood, he ordered us to wait a little and not to fire any shots from guns or crossbows or cannon, for as, as he wished to be justified in all that he might do, he made another appeal to the Indians through the interpreter Aguilar in the presence of the king's notary Diego de Godoy, asking the Indians to allow us to land and take water and speak to them about God and his majesty, and adding that should they make war on us, that if in defending ourselves some should be killed and others hurt, theirs would be the fault and the burden it would not lie with us, but they went on threatening that if, if we landed they would kill us. Then they boldly began to let arrows f fly arrows at us and made signals with their drums. Like valiant men, they surrounded us with their canoes and they all attacked us with such a shower of arrows that they kept us in the water in some parts up to our waists. As there was much mud and swamp at that place, we could not easily get clear of it. So many Indians fell on us and what, what with some hurling their lances with all their might and others shooting arrow to, arrows at us, we could not reach the land as soon as we wished. While Cortez was fighting, he lost a shoe in the mud and could not find it again and got on shore with one foot bare. Presently, someone picked up the shoe out of the mud and put it, he put it on again. While this was happening to Cortez, all of us captains as well as soldiers let the cry with the cry of Santiago fell upon the Indians and forced them to retreat, but they didn't, did not fall back far as they sheltered themselves beyond great barriers and stockades formed of thick logs until we pulled them apart and got, one, got to one of the small gateways of the town. There we attacked them again and we pushed them along through a street where other defenses had been erected. And there they turned on us and met us face to face and fought most valiantly, making the greatest efforts, shouting and whistling and crying, crying Al Calaccioni, which in their language meant in order to kill or capture our captain. While we were thus surrounded by them, Alonso de Avila and his soldiers came up. As I've already said, they came from the palm grove by land and could not arrive sooner on account of the swamps and creeks. Their delay was unavoidable, but just as we had been delayed over the summons of the Indians to surrender, and in breaking the openings of the barricades so as to enable us to attack them. Now we all joined together to drive the enemy out of their strongholds, and we compelled them to retreat. But like brave warriors, they kept on shooting showers of arrows and fire-hardened darts, and never turned their backs, us, backs on us, until we gained a great court with chambers and large halls, and three idle houses, where they had already carried all the goods they possessed. Cortez then ordered us to halt, and not to follow on and overtake the enemy in their flight. There and then Cortez took possession of that land for his majesty, performing the act in his majesty's name. It was done in this way. He drew his sword and as a sign of possession, he made three cuts in a huge tree called a Seba, which stood in the court of that great square and cried that if any person should raise objection, that he would defend the right with the sword and shield which he held in his hands. All of us soldiers were present when this happened and cried out that he did right in taking possession of the land in his majesty's name and we would aid him should any person say otherwise. This act was done in the presence of the royal notary. The partisans of Diego Velasquez choose to grumble at this act of taking possession. So there was another battle in that same area, in the area of Tabasco. And this is back to the narrative by Bernal Diaz. I have already said how we were marching along when we met all the forces of the enemy, which were moving in search of us. And all the men wore great feather crests, and they carried drums and trumpets, and their faces were colored black and white. And they were armed with large bows and arrows, lances and shields and swords, shaped like our two-handed swords, and many slings and stones and fire-hardened javelins, and all wore quilted cotton armor. As they approached us, their squadrons were so numerous that they covered the whole plain, and they rushed on us like mad dogs, completely surrounding us. 
and they let fly such a cloud of arrows, javelins, and stones that on the first assault they wounded over seventy of us, and fighting hand to hand, they did us great damage with their lances, and one soldier fell dead at once from an arrow wound to the ear, and they kept shooting and wounding us. With our muskets and crossbows and with good sword play, we did not fail as stout fighters, and when they came to feel the edge of our swords little by little, they fell back, but it was only as to shoot at us in greater safety. Mesa, our artilleryman, killed many of them with his cannon, for they were formed in great squadrons and did not open out so that he could fire at them as he pleased. But with all the hurts and wounds of which we gave them, we could not drive them off. I said to Diego de Ordas, It seems to me that we ought to close up and charge them, for in truth they suffered greatly from the strokes and thrusts of our swords, and that was why they fell away from us, both from fear of these swords and the better to shoot their arrows and hurl their javelins and the hail of stones. Ordas replied that it was not good advice, for there were three hundred Indians to every one of us, and that we could not hold out against such a multitude. So there we stood, enduring their attack. However, we did agree to get as near as, the, as we could to them, as I had advised Ordas, so as to give them a bad time with our swordsmanship, and they suffered so much from it that they retreated towards the swamp. During this time, Cortez and his horsemen failed to appear, although we greatly longed for them, and we feared that by chance some disaster had befallen them. I remember that when we fired shots, the Indians gave great shouts and whistles and threw dust and rubbish into the air so that we could not see the damage done to them, and they sounded their trumpets and drums and shouted and whistled and cried. Just at this time, we caught sight of our horsemen, and as the great Indian host was crazed with its, its attack on us, it did not at once perceive them coming up behind their backs, and as the plain was level ground and the horsemen were good riders, and many of the horses were very handy and fine gallopers, they came quickly on the enemy and spear them as they chose. As soon as we saw the horsemen, we fell on the Indians with such energy that with us attacking on one side and the horsemen on the other, they soon turned tail. The Indians thought that the horse and its rider was all one animal, for they had never seen horses up to this time. The savannas and fields were crowded with Indians running to take refu refuge in the thick woods nearby. After we had defeated the enemy, Cortez told us he had not been able to come to us sooner as there was a swamp in the way, and he had to fight his way through another force of warriors before he could reach us. Three horsemen and five horses had been wounded. As soon as the horsemen had dismounted under some trees and houses, we returned thanks to God for giving us so complete a victory. As it was Lady Day, we gave to the town which was afterwards founded here the name Santa Maria de la Victoria, on account of this great victory being won on Our Lady's Day. This was the first battle that we fought under Cortes in New Spain. After this, we bound up the hurts of the wounded with cloths, for we had nothing else, and we doctored the horses by searing their wounds with the fat from the body of a dead Indian, which we cut up to get out the fat, and we went to look at the dead lying on the plain, and there were more than 800 of them, the greater number killed by thrusts, the others by the cannon, muskets, and crossbows, and many were stretched out on the ground half dead. Where the horsemen had passed, numbers of them lay dead and groaning from their wounds. The battle lasted for over an hour, and the Indians fought all the time like brave warriors up until the horsemen came up. We took five prisoners, two of them captains. As it was late and we had enough of fighting, we had not eaten, eaten anything, so we returned to our camp. Then we buried the two soldiers who had been killed, one in the, by a wound in the air and the other by a wound in the throat. And we seared the wounds of the others and of the horses with the fat of the Indian, and after posting sentinels and guards, we had supper and rested. After this first victorious battle, Cortez decides he wants to speak to the local chieftain, so he sends out messengers, and they come to greet Cortez. The next day, thirty Indian chieftains, clad in good cloaks, came to visit us and brought fowls, fish, fruit, and maize cakes, and asked leave from Cortez to burn and bury the bodies of the dead who had fallen in the recent battles, so that they should not smell badly or be eaten by lions and tigers. Permission was at once given them, and they hastened to bring many people to bury and burn the bodies according to their customs. Cortes learned from the caciques that over 800 men were missing, not counting those who had been carried off wounded. They said they could not tarry with either to discuss the matter or make peace, for on the morrow the chieftains and leaders of all the towns would have assembled, and then they would agree about a peace. As Cortes was very sagacious about everything, he said, laughing, to us soldiers who happened to be in his company, Do you know, gentlemen, that it seems to me that the Indians are terrified at the horses and may think that they and the cannon alone make war on them? I have thought of something which will confirm this belief and that is to bring the mare belonging to Juan Sedeno, which foaled the other day on board ship, and tie her up where I am now standing, and also to bring the stallion of Ortiz, the musician, which is very excitable, near enough to scent the mare, and when he has scented her, to lead them off separately, so the caciques who are coming shall not hear the horse neighing as they approach, not until they are standing before me and are talking to me. We did just as Cortez ordered, and brought the horse and mare, and the horse soon detected the scent of her in Cortez's quarters. In addition to this, Cortez ordered the largest cannon that we possessed to be loaded with a large ball and a good charge of powder. 
About midday, 40 Indians arrived, all of them caciques of good bearing, wearing rich mantles such as are used by them. They saluted Cortez and all of us, and brought incense and fumigated all of us who were present. And they asked pardon for their past behavior and said that henceforth they would be friendly. Cortez, through Aguilar the interpreter, answered them in a very grave manner, as though he were angry, that they well knew how many times he had asked them to maintain peace, that the fault was theirs, and that now they deserved to be put to death, they and all the people of their towns, and, but that as we were the vassals of a great king and lord named Emperor Don Carlos, who had sent us to these countries and ordered us to help and favor those who would enter into his royal service, that if they were now as well disposed as they were said they were, that we would take this course, and that if they were not, some of these people would jump out and kill them. And some of the warriors were still angry because they had made war on us. At this moment, the order was secretly given to put on a match to the cannon which had been loaded, and it went off with such a thunderclap as was wanted, and the ball went buzzing over the hills as it was midday, and very still, it made a great noise, and the caciques were terrified on hearing it. As they had never seen anything like it, they believed what Cortez had told them was true. And Cortez, then Cortez told them, through Aguilar, not to be afraid, for he had given orders that no harm should be done to them. Just then, the horse that had scented the mare was brought up and tied up not far distant from where Cortez was talking to the caciques. And as the mare had been tied up to at the place where Cortez and the Indians were talking, the horse began to paw the ground and neigh, and become wild with excitement, looking all the time towards the Indians and the place whence the scent of the mare had reached him, and the caciques thought that he was roaring at them, and they were terrified. When Cortez observed their state of mind, he rose from his seat and went to the horse and told two orderlies to lead it far away, and said to the Indians that he had told the horse not to be angry, as they were friendly and wished to make peace. While this was going on, there arrived more than thirty Indian carriers, of whom the name natives call Temenes, who brought a meal of fowls, fish, fruits, and other food, and it appears they had lagged behind and could not reach us at the same time as the caciques. Cortez had a long conversation with these chieftains and caciques, and they told him that they would all come on the next day and bring a present, and would discuss other matters. matters. Then they went quite away contented. So you can see from this narrative how clever Cortez was in dealing with the natives, and how he used the cannon and the horses to terrify the locals. The lords of the local area provided Cortez with 30 women, and Cortez impressed upon them the potency of his emperor. And we return to the narrative. It says, We remained five days in this town to look after the wounded and those who were suffering from pain in the loins from which they all recovered. Furthermore, Cortez drew the caciques to him by kindly converse and told them how our master, the emperor, whose vassals we were, and under his orders had many great lords, and that it would be well for them also to render him obedience, and that then, whatever might be in need of, whether it was our protection or any other necessity, if they would make it known to him, no matter where he might be, he would come to their assistance. The caciques all thanked him for this, and thereupon all declared themselves the vassals of our great emperor. They were the first vassals to render submission to his majesty in New Spain. Cortez then ordered the caciques to come with their women and children early the next day, which was Palm Sunday, to the altar and pay home homage to the holy image of Our Lady and to the cross. And at the same time, Cortez ordered them to send six Indian carpenters to accompany our carpenters to the town of Cintla, where our Lord God was pleased to give us victory in the battle which I have described, and there to cut a cross on a great tree called a Seba, which grew there. And they did it so that it might last a long time, for as the bark is renewed, the cross will show there forever. When this was done, he ordered the Indians to get ready all the canoes that they had owned to help us to embark, for we wished to set sail on that holy day, because the pilots had come to tell Cortez that the ships ran a great risk from a northern, which is a dangerous gale. So you can see right here that as part of his conquest was the conversion of all the locals to Christianity. And it was in the port of San Juan de Ulua where Cortez met the emissaries of Montezuma, the chief of the Aztec Indians. Back to the narrative. The flagship hoisted her royal standards and pennants, and with a half an hour of anchoring, two large canoes, which in these parts are called piraguas, came out to us full of Mexican Indians. Seeing the big ship with the standards flying, they knew that it was there. They must go to speak with the captain. So they went direct to the flagship and going on board, asked who was the Tatuan, which in their language means the chief. Dona Marina, one of the translators, who understood the language, pointed him out. Then the, then the Indians paid many marks of respect to Cortez, according to their usage, and bade him welcome, and said that their lord, a servant of the great Montezuma, had sent them to ask what kind of men we were and what we were in search, and added that if we were in need of anything for ourselves or our ships, that we should tell them and they would supply it. Our Cortez thanked them through the two interpreters, Aguilar and Dona Marina, and ordered food and wine to be given them, 
and some blue beads. And after they had drunk, he told them that we had come to see them and to trade with them, and that our arrival in their country should cause them no uneasiness, but looked on by them as fortunate. By the end of this narrative, the local Indians would not think the arrival of the Spanish was fortunate. I'm going to skip forward to chapter 58 and discuss Cortez's decision to burn his ships and move inland to the capital of Mexico, Tenochtitlan. So I return here to the narrative. Being in Sempoala, as I have stated, and discussing with Cortez questions of warfare and our advance into the country and going on from one thing to another, we, who were his friends, counseled him, although others opposed it, not to leave a single ship in the port, but to destroy them all at once, so as to leave no, sur no source of trouble behind, lest when we were inland others of our people should rebel like the last. Besides, we should gain much additional strength from the masters, the pilots, and sailors who numbered nearly 100 men, and they would be better employed helping us to watch and fight than remaining in port. As far as I can make out, this matter of destroying the ships which we had su suggested to Cortez during our conversation had already been decided on by him, but he wished it to appear as though it came from us, so that if anyone should ask him to pay for the ships, he could say that he had acted on our advice and we would all be concerned in their payment. Then he sent Juan de Escalante, who was chief alguacil and a person of distinguished bravery and a great friend of Cortez and an enemy of Diego Velasquez because he had not given him good Indians on the island of Cuba to Villa Rica with orders to bring on shore all the anchors, cables, sails, and everything else on board which might prove useful, then to destroy the ships and preserve nothing but the boats and that the pilots, sailing masters, and sailors who were old and of no use for war should stay at the town with the two nets they possessed should undertake the fishing for there was always fish in that harbor although they were not very plentiful. Juan de Escalante did all that he was told to do and soon after arrived at Sempoala with a company of sailors whom he had brought from the ships, and some of them turned out to be very good soldiers. When this was done, Cortez sent to, su sent to summon all the caciques of the hill towns that were allied to us in rebellion against Montezuma, and told them how they must give their service to the Spaniards who remained in Villa Rica, to finish building the church, fortress, and houses. And Cortez took Juan de Escalante by the hand before them all and said to them, This is my brother, and told them to do whatever he should order them, and that they should that should they need protection or assistance against the Mexicans, they should go to him and he would come in person to their assistance. All the caciques willingly promised to do what might be asked of them, and I remember that they at once fumigated Juan de Escalante with incense, though he did not wish it done. I have already said that he was a man well qualified for any post and a great friend of Cortez, so he could place him in command of the town and harbor with confidence, so that if Diego Velasquez should send an expedition there, it would meet with re it would meet with resistance. I must leave him here and go on with my story. When the ships had been destroyed, with our full knowledge, when all the captains and soldiers were assembled and were talking to Cortez about military matter, matters, he begged us to listen to him and argued with us as follows. Quote, we all understood what was the work that lay before us, and that with the help of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must conquer in all battles and encounters, and must be as ready for them as was befitting. For if we or any were defeated, which pray God would not happen, we could not raise our heads again, as we were so few in numbers, and we could look for no help or assistance but that which came from God, for we no longer possess ships in which to return to Cuba, but must rely on our own good swords and stout hearts. And he went on to draw many comparisons and relate the heroic deeds of the Romans. Once in all, we answered him that we would obey his orders, and that when the die was cast for good fortune, as Caesar said when he crossed the Rubicon, that we were all of us ready to serve God and the king. After this excellent speech, which was delivered with more honeyed words and greater eloquence than I can express here, Cortez at once sent for, the, sent for the fat cacique and reminded him that he should treat the church and cross with great reverence and keep them clean. And he also told them that he meant to depart at once from Mexico to order Montezuma not to rob or offer human sacrifices, and that he now had need of 200 Indian carriers to transport his artillery. For as I've already said, these Indians can carry two arobas on their backs and march five leagues with it. He also asked 50 of the leading warriors to go with us. When our departure from Mexico had received full consideration, we sought advice as to the road we should take, and the chieftains of Sempoala were agreed that the best and most convenient road for us to take was through the province of Tlaxcala, for they were their allies and mortal enemy, enemies of the Mexicans. Forty chieftains, all warriors, were all already prepared to accompany us and were of great assistance to us on that journey, and they provided us as well with 200 carriers to transport our artillery. We poor, poor soldiers had no need of help, for at that time, we had nothing to carry except our arms, lances, muskets, crossbows, shields, and the like, which we both marched and slept, with which we both marched and slept, and we were shod with hempen shoes, as I have often said, and were always prepared for a fight. In the middle of August 1519, we set out from Sempoala, keeping always in good formation, and with scouts and some of the most active soldiers in advance. 
The first day we marched to the town called Jalapa, then to Socho Chima, a strong place with a difficult approach, approach, and inside there were many vines of the grapes of the country on trellises. In both those towns, through our interpreters, Doña Marina and Geromino, Geromino, Geronimo de Aguilar, all matters touching our holy religion were explained to the people, that we were the vassals of the Emperor Don Carlos, who had sent us to put an end to human sacrifices and robbery, and that they were told other things which is ad advantageous to state. As they were friends of the Sempualans and did not pay tribute to Montezuma, we found them very well disposed to us, towards us, and they provided us with food. A cross was erected in each town, and its meaning was explained to them, and they were told to hold it in great reverence. As soon as we had eaten, Cortez asked through our interpreters about their lord Montezuma. The chief told us of his great strength in warriors, which he kept in all the provinces under his sway, without counting many other armies which were posted on the frontiers and in neighboring provinces, and that Montezuma then spoke of the great fortress of Mexico, how the houses were built in the water, and how one can only pass from one house to another by means of bridges which they have made or canoes, and how all the houses have flat roofs, which by raising breastworks when they are needed can be turned into fortresses, that the city is entered by three causeways, each causeway having four or five openings in it, through which the water can flow from one part to the other, and each opening has a wooden bridge over it so that any one of the bridges is raised when any one of the bridges is raised, no one can enter the city of Mexico. Then the chief told us of the great store of gold and silver, and the stones and other riches which Montezuma, his lord, possessed, and he never ceased telling us how great a lord he was, so that Cortez and all of us marveled at hearing him. The more he told us about the great fortress and bridges of such stuff we Spanish soldiers made, the more we wanted to try our luck against them, although it seemed a hopeless enterprise, judging from what Olentecle explained and told us. In reality, Mexico was much stronger and had better munitions and defenses than anything he told us about, for it is one thing to have seen the place itself and its strength, quite another to describe it as I do. He added that Montezuma was so great a prince that he placed anything he chose under his rule, and that he did not know if he would be pleased when he heard of our stay in that town, and that we had been given lodgings and food without his permission. Cortez replied through our interpreters, I would have you know that we have come from distant lands at the order of our lord and king, the emperor Don Carlos who has many and great princes as his vassals, and he sends us to command your great prince Montezuma not to sacrifice or kill any more Indians, or to rob his vassals, or to seize any more lands, but to give his fealty to our lord the king. And now I say the same to you, Olentecle, and to all the other caciques who are with you. Desist from your sacrifices, and no longer eat the flesh of your own relations, and cease to commit sodomy and other evil customs which you practice, for such is the will of our lord God, whom we believe in and worship, the giver of life and death, who will take us up to heaven. He told of them of many other things concerning our holy religion, all of to which things they made no reply. Then here in this section titled 100,000 Human Skulls, Bernal Diaz describes these stone uh, human skull towers. Quote, I remember that in the plaza where some of their oratory stood, there were piles of human skulls so regularly ar arranged that one could count them, and I estimated them at more than 100,000. I repeat again that there were more than 100,000 of them. And in another part of the plaza, there were so many piles of dead men's thigh bones that one could not count them. There was also a large number of skulls strung out between beams of wood, and three priests who had charge of these bones and skulls were guarding them. We had occasion to see many such things later on as we penetrated into the country, for the same custom was observed in all the towns, including those of Tlachcala. On their way to the Mexican capital, Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztecs, Cortez and his group encounters a group of Clash Collins and fights his way through their city. Quote, the next day, after commending ourselves to God, we set out with all our ranks in good order, the horsemen well instructed in the way they should charge through the enemy and return to us, and see that the enemy should not be permitted to break our ranks and separate us one from the other. As we thus marched on, two armies of warriors approached to give us battle. They numbered 6,000 men, with loud shouts and the din of drums and trumpets, as they shot their arrows and hur hurled their darts and acted like brave warriors. Cortez ordered us to halt and sent forward the three prisoners whom we had captured the day before to tell them not to make war on us as we wished to treat them as brothers. He also told one of our soldiers, Diego de, de Godoy, who was a royal notary, to watch what took place so that he could bear witness if it should be necessary, so that at some future time we should not have to answer for the deaths and damages which we were likely to take place, for we begged them to keep the peace. When the three prisoners whom we had sent forward began to speak to the Indians, it only increased their fury, and they made such an attack on us that we could not endure it. Then Cortez sounded, shouted, Santiago, and at them, and we attacked them with such impetuosity that we killed and wounded many of them with our fire, and among them three captains. 
Then they began to retire towards some ravines where over 40,000 warriors and their captain general named Shikotenga were lying in ambush, all wearing a red and white device, for that was the badge and livery of Zikotenga. As there was broken ground there, we could, not make, we could make no use of the horses, but by careful maneuvering, we got past it. But the passage was very perilous, for they made play with their good archery and with their lances and broadswords did us much hurt, and the hail of stones from their slings was ever more damaging. When we reached the level ground with our horsemen and artillery, we paid them back and slew many of them, but we did not dare break our formation, for any soldier who left the ranks to follow some of the Indian captains and swordsmen was at once wounded and ran great danger. As the battle went on, they surrounded us on all sides, and we could do little, do little or nothing. We dared not charge them unless we charged all together, lest they should break up our formation. And if we did charge them, as Ab said, there were twenty squadrons ready to resist us, and our lives were in great danger, for they were so numerous they could have blinded us with handfuls of earth if God in his great mercy had not succoured us. While we found ourselves in this conflict among these great warriors and their fearful broadswords, we noticed that many of the strongest among them crowded together to lay hands on a horse. They set to work with a furious attack, laying hands on a good mare, known to be very handy for either sport or for charging. The rider, Pedro de Moron, was a very good horseman, and as he charged with three other horsemen into the ranks of the enemy, the Indian seized hold of his lance and he was not able to drag it away, and others gave him cuts with their broadswords and wounded him badly. Then they slashed at the mare and cut her head off at the neck so that it hung by the skin and she fell dead. If his mounted companions had not come at once to his rescue, they would have also finished killing Pedro de Moron. We might have possibly helped him with our whole battalion, but I repeat again, we hardly dared to move from one place to another for fear that they would finally rout us, and we could not move one way or another. It was all we could do to hold our own and prevent ourselves from being defeated. However, we rushed to the conflict around the mare and managed to save Moron from the hands of the enemy who were already dragging him off half dead, and we cut the, girths, the mare's girths so as not to leave the saddle behind. In that act of rescue, ten of our men were wounded, and I remember at the same time we killed four of the Indian captains, for we were advancing in close order, and we did great execution with our swords. When this had happened, our enemy began to retire, carrying the mare with them, and they cut her in pieces to exhibit in all the towns of Tlaxcala. And we learnt afterwards that they made an offering to their idols of the horseshoes, and of the Flemish felt hat, and the two letters which we had sent them offering peace. The mare that was killed belonged to Juan Cedeno. And it was because Sedeno had received three wounds the day before that he had given her to Moron, who was a good horseman. I did not see Moron again, for he died of his wounds two days later. To return to our battle, we were a full hour fighting in the fray, and our shots must have done the enemy much damage, for they were so numerous and in such close formation that each shot must have hit many of them. Horsemen, musketeers, crossbowmen, swordsmen, and those who used lance and shield, one and all, we fought like men to save our lives and do our duty, for we were certainly in the greatest danger in which we had ever found ourselves. Later on, they told us that we killed many Indians in this battle, among them eight of their leading captains, sons of the old caciques who lived in their principal town, and for this reason they drew off in good order. We did not attempt to follow them, for we were not sorry as, we, as that we were so tired out we could hardly stand, and we stayed where we were in that little town. All of the country round was thickly peopled, and they even had some underground houses, like caves which many of the Indians lived. The place where this battle took place is called Tuacachingo, and it was fought on the second day of the month of September in the year 1519. When we saw that victory was ours, we gave thanks to God who would deliver us from such great danger. On to chapter 72. Quote, As our Lord God, through his great loving kindness, was pleased to give us victory in those battles in Tlaxcala, our fame spread throughout the surrounding country and reached the ears of the great Montezuma in the great city of Mexico. And if hitherto they took us for tueles, which is the same as their idols, from now on they held us in even greater respect as valiant warriors, and terror fell on the whole country at learning how, being so few in number in the Tlash Collins in such great, great force, we had conquered them, and that they had sued us for peace. So that now Montezuma, the great prince of Mexico, powerful as he was, was in fear of our going into his city, and sent five chieftains, men of much importance, to our camp at Tlaxcala to bid us welcome, and say that he was rejoiced at our great victory and so many squad against so many squadrons of warriors, as he sent a present, a matter of a thousand dollars worth of gold, and a very rich jeweled ornaments, worked in various shapes, and twenty loads of fine cotton cloth, and he sent word that he wished to become a vassal of our great emperor, and that he was pleased that we were already near his city on account of the goodwill that he bore Cortez and all his brothers, the Tules, who were with him, and that he, Cortez, should decide on how much tribute he wished for every year of our great emperor, and that he, Montezuma, would give it in gold and silver cloth, cloth and chalchihutes, provided we would not come to Mexico. This was not because he would not receive us with the greatest willingness, but because the land was so rough and sterile, 
He would regret to see us undergo such hardships as perchance he might not be able to alleviate as, a well, as, as well as he could wish. Cortez answered by saying that he highly appreciated the goodwill shown us and the present which had been sent, and he offered to pay tribute to his majesty, and he begged the messengers not to depart until he went into the capital of Tlaxcala, as he would dispatch them from that place, and they could then see how that the war had ended. So while Cortez was in Tlaxcala, he asked some of the head chieftains about Montezuma and Mexico, and here's what they replied. Quote, he said that Montezuma had such great strength in warriors that when he wished to capture a great city or make a raid on a province, he could place 150,000 men in the field, and this they knew well from the experience of the wars and hostilities they had had with them for more than 100 years past. Cortez asked them how it was that so many warriors, as they said, came down on them as they had never been entirely conquered. They answered that although Mexicans sometimes defeated them and killed them and carried off many of their vassals for sacrifice, many of the enemy were also left dead on the field and others were made prisoners so that they never could come so secretly that they not get some warning and that when they knew of their approach, they mustered all their forces and with the help of the people of Huichotzingo, they defended themselves and made counterattacks. That as all the provinces which had been raided by Montezuma and placed under his rule were ill-disposed towards Mexicans and that their inhabitants were carried off by force to the wars and they did not fight with good will. Indeed, it was from these very men that they received warnings, and for this reason they had been defended. They had defended their country to the best of their ability. And they told us about the great staff of servants in his house, and the story would never cease were I to attempt to describe it all here, and of the many women he possessed, and how he married off some of them. In fact, they gave us an account of everything. Then they spoke of the great fortifications of the city, what the lake was like, and the lake was like, and the depth of the water, and about the causeways that give access to the city and the wooden bridges in each causeway, and how one can go in and out by water through the opening that there is in each bridge, and how when the bridges are raised, one can cut, be cut off between the bridge and bridge and not be able to reach the city, how the greater part of the city was built in the lake, and that one could not pass from house to house except by drawbridges and canoes which they all had ready, and that all the houses were flat-roofed and all the roofs were provided with parapets so they could fight from them. They also told us about the way the city was provided with fresh water from a spring called Chapultepec, distant about a half a league from the city, and how the water enters by aqueduct and reaches a place where they can carry it in canoes and sell it in the streets. When they told us about the arms that were used, such as two-pronged javelins which they hurl with throwing sticks and will go through any sort of armor, and that there are many good archers and others with lances with flint edges which have a fathom of cutting edge, so cleverly made they cut better than knives, and they have shields and cotton armor, and there are many slingers who sling rounded stones, and others with very good and long lances, stone-edged, two-handed swords. Swords. They brought us pictures of the battles they had fought with the Mexicans, painted on large henequin cloths, showing their manner of fighting. As our captain and all of us had already heard about all that the caciques were telling us, we changed the subject and started them on another more profound, which was, how was it that they had come to inhabit that land, and from what direction had they come? And how was it that they had differed so much from and were so hostile to the Mexicans, seeing that their countries were so close to one another? They said that their ancestors had told them that in times past there had lived among them men and women of giant size with huge bones, and because they were very bad people of evil manners, that they had fought with them and killed them, and those of them who remained died off. So that we could see how huge and tall these, these people had been, they brought us a leg bone of one of them which was very thick and the height of a man of ordinary stature, and that was the bone from the hip to the knee. I measured myself against it, and it was as tall as I am, although I am of fair size. They brought other pieces of bone like the first, but they were already eaten away and destroyed by the soil. We were all amazed at seeing these bones and felt sure there must have been giants in this country. And our Captain Cortez said to us that it would be well to send the great bone to Castile so that His Majesty might see it. So we sent it with the first of our agents who went there. These caciques also told us that they had learned from their forefathers that one of their idols, to which they paid the greatest devotion, had told them that men would come from distant lands in the direction of the rising sun to subjugate them and govern them, and that if we were those men, they were rejoiced at it, as we were so good and brave, that when they made their peace with us, they had borne in mind that their idols had said, and for this reason they had given us their daughters so as to obtain relations who would defend them against the Mexicans. When they finished their discourse, we were all astounded and said, Can this, they possibly have spoken the truth? Then our Captain Cortez replied to them and said that certainly we came from the direction of the sunrise, that our Lord and King had sent us for this very purpose, that we should become as brothers to them. For he had heard of them, and he prayed God to give us grace, so that by our hands and our intercession they would be saved. And we all said, Amen. So that's a great place to stop in this narrative. Again, that was The Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz. 
a very detailed analysis of Hernan Cortez's conquest of Mexico, detailing the land, from the landing to all the battles to the final victory of the Spanish conquistadors. So I hope you enjoyed the show. I will include links to the books that you can find online. And this was only page 288 of about a thousand pages of information. So there's a lot more to talk about. But uh, thank you. Have a good evening.